Hello everyone, I'm Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind, which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and media around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity, or if you will, human centricity. We regularly talk to DPOs, CMOs, CDOs, and whoever else we find interesting and able to share valuable insights. So we hope you like it. Please do reach out if you have any ideas on future topics or speakers. Well, I once had the late, great Adrian Sterling as a copyright professor at my LLM at Queen Mary University in London, and I loved the subject and the manner in which different cultures looked at creative works and innovation. But that was 20 years ago. And copyright is now back on the table of TPOs, CPOs, and even marketing technology people who started dealing with privacy work and now have been charged with AI governance. So, of course, AI governance may seem like a natural fit for privacy experts, to the point that data protection authorities are also starting to double down as AI supervisory authorities. And well-known professional associations are adding AI-related topics to their conferences and training courses. But as you all know, by simply looking at the proposed EU AI Act, or the frameworks, or by reading the news, AI governance is also overlapping with copyright law in a big way. And once stepping into this minefield, many of you may feel completely out of your element. So as much as we may love the novelty, you may not have looked at copyright law since law school, if at all. So we need less speculation and more real experts, and we have found a top one for the matter at hand. Jacob Plesner Matthiasen is an attorney with a focus on intellectual property and emerging technologies. He serves as the secretary for the Danish Society for Copyright Law and is the mind behind the Danish Entertainment Law Podcast. He also teaches entertainment law at the University of Copenhagen. With Jacob, we'll try to better understand the copyright implications of generative AI now that fair use or fair dealing, depending on your jurisdiction, don't seem to be the silver bullet that many hoped. When it comes to training foundation models or the many AI tools, now exploding all over the place on top of such models. So a few questions that we need to look at. Can the exemptions that we already have, so written in the law, be understood to include text mining or data mining for machine learning purposes? Is the output of a simple prompt on Midjourney or DALI copyright protectable? What do we do if Japan the EU, the US, China, go in very different directions in their answers to these questions. As a note, I will add that whenever we mention the DSM, we refer to the 2019 EU Directive on Copyright in the Digital Single Market. There's a link to it. And that when Jacob talks about the InfoSoc Directive, he refers to the prior 2001 Directive dealing with the initial copyright challenges presented by the internet back then. Let's go for it. Jacob, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. It's so good to have someone from the copyright angle. You know, we have a lot of people talking about AI. And these days, it seems like everybody who is doing privacy now is an AI expert. (laughs) I think the same goes with with copyright, uh, I've seen a lot of AI experts within the copyright world. So, uh, uh, but I think the fast development has taken a, a, a caught everybody body with surprise since the launch of uh, OpenAI's uh, ChatGPT in November. People are excited, and that's always good. And and you know, this uh, this burning question, and I'll start with that. So, starting with the end, in a way, which is copyright exceptions because everybody has heard that you know chat gpt and other 
you know, sort of foundation models have been trained on works which were originally protected. And we know about the Getty Images lawsuit. And we just heard, or maybe a few weeks ago, about another lawsuit, which I think came from the creator of um, Game of Thrones. Yeah, I think it's uh, George Martin. Okay, thank you, George Martin. So, assuming that it's happened, and that we have been training all of these algorithms on works that were publicly available, but protected, are there any exceptions? Well, if we look at the, the European um, situation first, because we need to acknowledge that the, there probably will be a, a difference between uh, your, your different jurisdictions, uh, the US, Japan, Europe, and the like. Um, in Europe, uh, we have exemptions uh, that might be relevant for training of AI the problem with these exceptions, though, is that when they were made uh, in the InfoSoc directive and in the DSM directive, the latest, uh, no one uh, could foresee uh, the generative AI engines uh, that we have today. Uh, so we have in Europe two main exemptions. Uh, you have one for actually machine learning, uh, temporary copies uh, in the InfoSoc directive, and you have one for uh, text and data mining. Um, which is something that AI does. Uh, uh, it's, it mines data uh, and text uh, and, and learns from it. Um, the problem, however, and I will say the million-dollar question is, does these exemptions uh, also cover uh, works generated by AI and the training? Um, and um, I'm sad to say that um, it is probably not settle at least it's, it's not clear from the legislation uh i think it is clear that they can train at least to some part the engines uh but um yeah it uh, in europe it uh, it is unclear whether the uh, the output uh, from the engine uh, is is legal and as you say we have seen um uh, cases in the us the latest with grissom and you mentioned two cases there are plenty more uh, either are going on or uh, there will be um, and um, in the US uh, the law is of course uh, different uh, than the, uh, the European and um, yeah you have to look at fair use for example uh, but we have to uh, sell it by courts um, and one thing also uh, worth mentioning um, in the European legislation uh, you have the possibility uh, to opt out and say to uh, um, uh, the AI engines that uh, they're not allowed to train on your data. Again, um, this is a data podcast, so uh, we can be a bit nerdy about it, uh, but you both have to do that in a way that is legally solid, but also technical solid. So actually it can be a bit difficult for a right holder to be aware that they have to opt out and also to do it in the right way. Um, and when you then add that it's uncertain uh, whether or not they are actually allowed to train your data, then I would say it's fair to say that the legal status in both Europe and the US is quite murky. And um, we need to have some court cases uh, to to settle the issue. You know, when you mentioned the uh, the the opt out for personal yeah. data, I think there's a funny overlap where someone may be both protecting their privacy and their work. You've got your memories, like your life memories, so you're writing about it. It's creative. It's a work of art. In a way, it's a work. But you're talking about yourself, so it involves your privacy and it involves your creation. So that's a place where you've got privacy and copyright. Does it ever come up or is it a crazy thought? No, it's not a crazy thought uh, at all. And uh, I think what has, in Europe again, that's of course my home field, uh, what has struck people by surprise uh, in Europe um, is that if 
these exceptions uh, with text and data mining in the DSM directive, um, if they are valid and can be used here, then you change the whole situation uh, and the game as we know it. Because normally, when it comes to personal data, when it comes to uh, copyright protection, <clears throat> As a right holder or as a person, there's a general, at least copyright, uh, there is a general principle that you need to give permission. You need to opt in, as you, if, if you put that uh, term, uh, for someone to use your material. And right now, at least to some extent with text and data mining, people can take your content unless you opt out and you opt out in the right way. And that frustrates many right holders uh, because they fear that they now have to, and the same goes with personal data, I guess, that they have to uh, be their own detective and uh, look at all these AI engines and say, do you have my data? Uh, have you trained on my data? And uh, do you accept my... Um, opt out my uh, own reservations. Um, and that's something at least um, I know that many riot holders fear. And uh, again, it is not something that uh, is uh, has been cleared uh, either by legislation or by the courts yet. So uh, it's an interesting situation uh, where I think everything is, is up in the air, uh, which is of course, demonstrated by the many uh, lawsuits uh, around the world. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is that, uh, in a way, this is not a revolutionary in the sense, meaning the, the migration from an opt-in where I need to ask you if I want to use your article for a derivative work. I need to ask you first, as it used to be the case, with the advent of YouTube and all of these platforms where you've got an automated system to scan through the music they use as a background to then tell you whether it is protected or not. And then people sort of negotiating in bulk, right, uh, those rights to sort of compensate by default, assuming that there is no way you're going to have a workflow in place for the prior approval. So if we already had a slow migration towards an opt-out, simply because, again, everybody became an editor and a creator and, you know, and an author in a way and a publisher. Um, it, it's only one step farther. Is that is that right? You could say, I think that the, the analogy to uh, the cases with uh, the, the platforms that we know with user-generated content like YouTube um, uh, is quite uh, on the mark. You could say in the old... Uh, Web2 world uh, with user-generated content prior to the DSM directive, um, these services um, were able to have user-generated content uh, um, on their site uh, without, at least to some extent, the permission from the right holders, unless they were in bad faith. And the right holders had to uh, have these notice and takedown, uh, which you know in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the US is the same, uh, in, or was the same in Europe with the E Commerce Act. They had to uh, every time go out and say whether the content had been used and whether it should be removed. As you, I think you say, uh, then there were uh, so the content were licensed. This training data could be licensed as well. Uh, we're seeing uh, progress on that as well. Um, and uh, then, of course, that's a different ball game. We got a new regulation in the DSM directive, Article 17, uh, which changes the situation with user-generated content. But I see similarities between the user-generated world uh, and the right holder's position and then the, this training data world uh, where uh, we have this uh, situation where it's blurred whether or not these AI engines are allowed to use data. But I hear from at least European politicians, especially the Danish, of course, uh, my home country, um, that uh, they are aware that there was this uncertainty uh, previously with user-generated content, and they want to uh, avoid having the same situation with with AI. So I think uh, it will be uh, um, uh, cleared uh, up right quite
quite quickly. Um, I think it was uh, the president of uh, the European Commission, uh, uh, Ursula von uh, der Leyen, who also said that uh, they were working on uh, developing global standards quite urgently. Uh, so we need to have that fixed uh, sooner than later. Well, I read about Japan, where I believe their copyright act was uh, amended in 2020, if I remember. And then it was so recent that they could already squeeze in an exception for, or an exemption for text mining. Yes, uh, I've heard about uh, the Japanese approach. Of course, not. I'm not an expert in, in Japanese law, but uh, um, it points in the same direction as some uh, interprets uh, the European legislation that uh, uh, text and data mining is okay unless you have opt out. And again, and therefore it becomes a difficult subject and discussion, but there is a difference between text and data mining where you learn a system something. For example, I think that you can give it a vast amount of data and uh, then you can make it analyze uh, uh, how the, if you give it traffic data about the public transportation, uh, it can then analyze a lot of data about uh, where are the risk at, you know, when is there a queue in the transportation system? When is, is there a risk of accidents, et cetera, et cetera. And it needs, of course, to be trained on a lot of uh, data to learn this. That was something basic that uh, could be done with legislation uh, um, when it was uh, made. Uh, but then you have this completely different system, uh, the generative AI, where it can also create products. So you could actually have a situation where we could say, okay, perhaps you could use these exceptions to train your systems. However, the products that come out of the systems need to be looked at separately. So uh, you can actually make products out of the systems. You can only use them to uh, obtain knowledge. Uh, that's also a theory uh, that is uh, uh, spinning around uh, um, uh, currently. So you have different possibilities from it's legal to it's uh, not legal till this mixed situation. Yeah, this idea that whatever you create, yes, you need permission to build a collage or to put together pieces from others, but then you have your own input into this thing, like so many artists. And that new work is protected. What you say now, if I understand well, is that we are going to introduce constraints to the level of protection that we grant whatever is produced through tools that have been trained on such non-consented works. You might, um, it's, it's up in the air at least that uh, the output, even though you have an exemption for training uh, the engine, uh, uh, that it might not cover the output. Uh, that's at least something uh, which is uh, has not been settled yet. And I'm just introducing it because uh, um, it could be uh, very black and white uh, when you discuss this. Either it's legal uh, or it's illegal uh, with the training. Uh, but you could have this uh, mixed situation. Um, and of course, a mixed situation is not preferable because uh, uh, it's easier to say that, okay, it's either legal or it's legal. And that also goes for the output. But keep in mind that no legislation, perhaps with the exception of the Jap Japanese, uh, was made when generative AI uh, was uh, really at the table. And I would say that's in my world when uh, ChatGPT was uh, launched in November uh, last year. Uh, as the, That's the date, uh, the iPhone moment, as we <laughs> call it. Um, but again, but there's another issue. I don't know what, if you want to discuss that. That's, of course, with the output, Please. whether or not that's copyright protectable. Because uh, um, if we look besides the machine learning, um, uh, which is the hottest topic right now, which is the center of all the lawsuits. Uh, then we have a close run-up, uh, which is also the center of lawsuits and also a lot of applications to the US Copyright Office. Uh, 
Um, and that's whether or not the output could be copyright protected. And also, I would say uh, a follow-up question, whether the output could infringe other uh, person's uh, copyright and who's responsible. Uh, there are a lot of lawsuits uh, surrounding uh, uh, those issues. Um, and that's, of course, because normally our classical uh, view of the subject was, and that goes for uh, all jurisdictions, if you need copyright uh, protection, uh, then uh, you have to have human intervention. You have to have some creative choices. Um, and, you know, I've also been teaching at uh, the university at Copenhagen. And uh, normally Walter said, and that therefore, and it was just a simple question, can animals have copyright protection? No. Is there any case law? Yes, we have a case law from the US where... Uh, a monkey took a selfie, the famous uh, monkey <laughs> selfie, and uh, therefore no copyright protection. Yeah. And yeah. can machines uh, have copyright? No. So if you and a computer make a random image, it's not protected by copyright. And then generative AI entered. Yeah, but then generative AI enters the stage, and suddenly uh, you have a lot of problems because. Uh, if you uh, go into Mid Journey or Dali and um, uh, enter a very specific prompt, uh, draw a picture of a cat surfing uh, the waves uh, outside of uh, San Francisco, um, the sun is shining, use this camera and use this, this, and this, you have this picture. Uh, and is that copyright protected? Yeah, is there a new bicycle? for the mind and therefore it's your mind and it was your prompt and you know how easy do we need to make it or how or how hard do we need to make it we have been listening to people in the u.s saying that fair use would cover it so far and that just in case it wasn't the new opt-out proposed by OpenAI, which is that you simply add the gpt bot to your you know uh, robots.txt exactly. file in your on your website, for example, it would just keep that user agent out of you know the, the the scraping and scanning your content. But if it wasn't that clear, we wouldn't have had two things we've seen. Adobe has been training their own Firefly product on their own copyrighted you know bank of images and claiming that they would help people out if anybody who used Photoshop or any other products to produce new images with Firefly was ever sued by someone. That's how confident they said they were. Then Microsoft, as a sort of, <laughs> sort of you know, a reply to that, a few weeks later said, look, we are using OpenAI, but if you are sued, we will protect you. We will go to court. And I never understood whether it was they really want to be the ones acting before the court to make sure that, you know, case law goes in their favor or whether they want to simply take care of the fees, which doesn't sound so likely. But I don't know. So my only point is that fair use is therefore not so clearly established. So in, in that context, we have this scenario. Let me just give you an example. I think it was 20 years ago that we had Vanilla Ice writing that. So you remember yes, yes, Vanilla yes. Ice with Ice Ice Baby. They were sued by Queen. It was, was it Queen or David Bowie? I think it was Queen. Yeah, but I think he lost and then he bought uh, the, the composer's right to uh, 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 as I recall it, uh, he bought the, the right uh, to the composition uh, owned by uh, David Bowie and uh, and Queen. So he actually lost, but then ended up by buying um, the composition. At least I have to check it, but uh, I'm, that's how I recall it. Or well, it's a happy ending then. But I was thinking, picture, you know, Vanilla Ice today, right? Yeah. So Vanilla Ice goes and searches for a rhythm, for a beat that he likes, and he makes a tune out of that using, you know, generative AI. And 
in the past we had that scenario he never asked for their permission today there'll be billions or millions of vanilla ices out there produ producing you know millions of ice ice babies and we may end up in a scenario in which all of them are simply going to be going ahead producing this content bumping into each other when they reach spotify for example <laughs> and then if they are not finding an opt-out hoping for protection for every single one of these works do you think the world can get to such wild scenario i think that a lot of these wild scenarios uh, they will be uh, avoided uh, because uh, uh, I have a lot of trust in in the copyright system, um, and um, uh, so you need. I think some of these issues is my may be done a bit more complicated than they they are. Um, I think that I acknowledge that the training data is very uh, difficult and uh, and murky, um, uh, but you have some. Uh, basic rules regarding a copyright protection as we spoke about when is something protected and uh, when it comes to uh, um, if i understand your question correctly uh, if you can have a lot of um, uh, uh, copies or sound alikes or, or the like then we actually have a quite strong protection uh, for uh, against uh, um, uh, sound alikes and i know that uh, um, uh, um, uh, streaming platforms like Spotify, uh, I think they will um, do a good job in cleaning out uh, all the AI rubbish because I think that the, the um, uh, larger um, uh, music labels, uh, uh, they will tell them uh, that uh, they have to do so. And I was when I say AI rubbish, I think, uh, please don't misunderstand me, because AI can do a lot of good, but it's when some, someone de deliberately uh, tries to uh, rip off someone's song and, you know, just makes an easy box. Uh, um, and we're seeing a lot of that uh, currently. And uh, you can, of course, upload a lot of AI-generated uh, songs which are not actually songs but just rip rip offs um, and then earn uh, a lot of clicks uh, uh, but I think that that's something that will be avoided but we will have some interesting cases with both sound alikes and uh, and copyright protection so Jacob last last thought do you think this will end up in Geneva do we end up with some sort of agreement at the WIPO I think we will end up with uh, uh, some sort of harmonization um, and um, I'm quite positive on that. And I'm actually also quite positive that it will go quite quickly. The EU, the US uh, seem to be of the same, uh, um, uh, quite uh, committed to finding a solution. And uh, so therefore, um, it's an interesting situation. It's unclear in almost all territories, uh, a lot of these issues, but I think we will we'll have it harmonized and uh, also in uh, perhaps quicker than people uh, think right now. Very good. Good for lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thanks again. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, that's all for today. And you will find some episode notes and links to our social channels on mastersofprivacy.com. Thank you for listening.